Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage to share his thoughts on business leadership, Mr. John McGrath. Thanks, Anthony. Well, good morning. Good to uh, everyone here together. So we have, uh, I think, like 40 minutes together. It's always hard to know when you get a group of different business people. If I'm speaking to my team here and we're speaking about real estate, it's kind of focused on topic. And when you've got you know a couple of hundred people from all different walks of life, businesses and, and sectors, it's a bit harder. But it reminds me about a decade ago, so it's probably more than that, 12 years ago, I was giving a speech for BRW, the Business Review Weekly magazine. And I was in the city of what was those days called the Regent Hotel. It's the Four Seasons, I think, now down at the end of George Street. So um, I got there before, it was a 6.30 evening speech. It was kind of like 45, 60 minutes, business people. The idea was come from the local business area and do a little presentation, a bit like today. So I went through, the room had been sealed off. I went through and I went through slides, I went through the slide clicker, I went through the microphone, all those sort of, sort of little simple checkup things. And I saw this young guy down on the right-hand side of the room. So as I was going, I realised he wasn't a part of the organising committee, he wasn't a part of BRW. He had a folder and a little shoulder bag, so I figured he was a delegate there. He's a very young guy, early 20s. So when I kind of finished my stuff, I went across and I introduced myself and I said, you know, you're with the group? He said, no, 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 I'm, I'm coming tonight. I just was watching you get organised. I said, oh, great. Well, what do you do? And he said, well, my name's Wayne and I'm in technology. And I said, great space, great sector to be, really well done. And I said, and where's your office? And he said, Brisbane. I said, so you're in Sydney today on business? He said, no, no, I've just flown down. He said, I've saved for this. And he said, I've just started my own business. And he said, I'm working from home and I've saved for this. And I just want to get on a plane. I wanted to hear what you had to say. I said, well, I don't often get the chance to sit one-on-one -on -one or speak one-on-one -on -one with people before these presentations. So let's take the opportunity. I said, what do you want to get out of the next hour? And he said, well, it's pretty simple. He said, I'm very focused. I saw the article. I saw you were going to talk about business success. He said, I suspect in the next hour you're going to change my life. <laughs> I said, shit, Wayne, that's a hell of a task for a speaker at 60 minutes. <laughs> but I'll do my best. But then I thought, so number one is, you know, did you come mentally prepared, not just for this, but for the whole day, for the whole week, for everything you're doing, for your first meetings? Are you mentally prepared? One of the things I often say when I'm coaching my team is are you ready to go professional? Because most people are amateurs. So when you arrive at an event and there's the opportunity to network with a couple hundred people, and there's the opportunity to listen for half an hour to someone that's done something, um, and there's the opportunity to do a whole range of things, are you in the right mind space to extract maximum value? So 12 years later, I still remember that comment from Wayne, and I've never bumped into him to my knowledge since then, but I have no doubt that he would have maximised his success to a large degree because he took the effort to do something and further educate himself and he arrived with a mindset that I'm going to change my life. So in reality, can life change in 60 minutes? 100%. Life can change in six minutes. What causes life to change? Because I look at it and I think, this is the lucky country. Seriously, if you did a NPS score on, on every country with regard to its business opportunity, its lifestyle, its its stability, um, the, the richness of, of living a, a life in the real sense, not the commercial sense, because one of my views, by the way, there's a business audience, not looking to offend, but life's primary, far more important than business. But business funds life and business is an incredible opportunity to get ahead and to do exciting things and take exciting adventures. But if this is the lucky country, and I'll add to that that I think these are the halcyon days, people are going to look back in 100 years and say, wow, imagine being alive in the sort of early 2000s when you know, the internet was just changing the way people did things, where databases were allowing you to communicate personally with thousands of people in a more intimate fashion. When, when mobile technology meant that there were no dead spots anymore, if you're driving for an hour, you could have an hour worth of conversations with customers, past, present or future. So if the, in the world of business, if this is the lucky country and these are halcyon days, I'll actually, I'll double click into the lucky country because I think this particular part of Australia is close to the most exciting 50 square kilometres we have. When you look at the growth opportunities, the proximity to what is unarguably one of the world's greatest CBDs, when you look at the lifestyle that's available here within a 5, 10, 15 minute drive of what we have here today, it's unarguable that everyone in this room is probably sitting on the greatest opportunity available in business right now in the world anywhere. 
doesn't really matter what you do. I don't care if you have a laundromat or if you're into IT or into real estate, but this is an opportunity unrivaled. So the question is why, and I'm not talking necessarily about the smart brigade that gets up at seven and comes to the event and networks, I'm talking about why do most of our peers, colleagues, associates out there seem to constantly struggle? Why is it in the lucky country in the halcyon days that people struggle? That's kind of what I'll try and address here today and, and have a look at what are the things that are holding us back? What are the things that propel us forward to the next level? Coach John Wooden was one of the most famous sporting coaches, but also became really someone as a mentor for many business people because he had an unrivaled track record when it came to sport. So we've just had the NRL and the AFL Grand Finals. He used to coach in the NFA in, uh, uh, in America, NBA in America. And he won 10 premierships. So imagine a, a sporting team in this day and age winning 10 premierships, of which seven were consecutive, seven years in a row national championships. So he was a guy that I wanted, because my LT, but later my background was sports before it was real estate. And when there was a book written about John Wooden by some of his players and an author that you know just loved his philosophy, and I read the book and there was a bit that really stood out for me. It was when one of his players talked about the first day in the dressing room with Coach Wooden. He'd assembled this team of young elite athletes and he got them in the dressing room and these guys thought they were the best things on the planet. And they deserved to be because they were elite athletes, absolutely. And the best of the best. And the guy said that in, in his little uh, um, reference to that meeting, he said, I can't believe it. He sat us all down. He said, I'm going to tell you something that's going to really be an important thing. So listen clearly. He said, it's what you learn after you know it all that changes your life. What you learn after you know it all that changes your life. So what does that mean? Well, when you're talking to elite athletes, when one uses the phrase know it all, it means, well, they're fantastic at what they do. They're brilliant, they've studied hard, they've got to an elite level, they're in momentum, they're successful, there's no doubt about that. And the same in a group of business people like this. You guys wouldn't be sitting in the room, member of the Chamber of Commerce, in one of the greatest and most competitive environments in the world, unless you knew an enormous amount of stuff. The question is, what are you learning on a daily basis? So I'll just share my personal uh, insights and my personal habits with regard to that is I, I do one to two hours learning every single day as a minimum. So what do I not do? I don't listen to the news. I don't listen to the 6.30 a.m. Uh, you know, Alan Jones show. Alan's a, a fantastic uh, media, but it's not what I want to do to start my day. At the end of the day, I don't want to sit down and click on the six o'clock news and listen to all the carnage around the planet. I'm actually listening to podcasts, I'm reading books, I'm meeting with people that inspire me. Because if you replace that habit, because most of us have fairly mediocre habits. So what's a mediocre habit? It's like kind of listening to the stuff that drags you down. Because I'm a believer that you can shield out the majority of the negativity in the world. So, you know, reducing your appetite for things that are of the negative. Now that includes people, places, activities, the, you know, cutting yourself out of those if you want to get to another place, because here's one of the, the realities, and I talk about um, if you want to uh, get ahead, you've got to think much, much, much bigger. But what's going to get you to the next level is going to be a different set of activities and actions and decisions that got you this level. And or as I often say to my team, is what got you here won't get you there. Does that make sense? This is an English-speaking audience, isn't it? <laughs> Shit, I thought that was a waste of 15 minutes. <laughs> I thought it was a waste of 10 minutes there. So, yeah, if you, but if you think about that, so, and people nod and, you know, you say that, what got you here won't get you there, and they say, well, that makes sense. But what are you doing today to get you to another place? What are you reading? What are you listening to? Who are you meeting? So hopefully our little meeting here together will be one of those tiny catalysts along the way, or pebbles in the pond, but what else are you doing when you leave here that's different? What are your team doing? What is your business doing to evolve to the next level? Where are you challenging yourself to go to the next level? So these are the sort of things that I'm going to talk through over the next half an hour and just really, as I'm talking, think about how does that fit with you? Because brutal honesty is one of the first ways to get to the next level. Ruthlessly eliminating excuses. Because most of us have excuses about the reasons we're not doing better. And most of those excuses have nothing to do with why we're not doing better. Even those that are doing well tend to lay blame elsewhere. So we'll have a look at that. The only single person on the planet holding you back is sitting in your chair right now. Is that a fair assumption? And yet when I talk to people saying, you know, what's happening, man? You're kind of like a little bit low in your numbers or the business is not doing as well as it could or you're down on last year. They end up giving me a list of things, right? 
well, John, you know, I understand that the statistic is here and the competitors are under quoting and undercharging and this is happening and that's happening and all the rest. And they give you this kind of long list. And guess what's never on the list? Them. The only thing on the list is them because everything else can be adjusted. So the, you know, the real key going forward is to take responsibility and ruthlessly eliminating excuses, I said. Great, so just tell you a little bit about my, my background. Uh, I was not interested in real estate as a kid. I had no connection to this industry as, as a, a youngster. My parents were not in it. My dad used to run a pub in Bexley. Um, and I actually wanted to be a sports person. I wanted to play rugby league for Australia. So that was my dream. All kids have dreams. Mine actually was one that I was moving towards quite rapidly. I was playing in the under 21s competition when I was 16 years of age. I was playing first grade uh, in terms of the school competition when I was in year 10, not year 12. So I was actually what probably people would consider a fairly elite athlete and therefore having a dream of playing for Australia was fa fairly good quality dream. And in those days, we're going back you know, 35 years, in those days footballers didn't get paid huge livings. It was just kind of a job you did if you were a good footballer and you, most of you would work during the day and then you would play football on weekends. It was starting to become more professional but it was still quite an amateur sort of job. So it was not something that was probably ever going to make me a fortune in terms of that but that wasn't relevant to me. I came from working class family and I just wanted to play for Australia. I thought that would be a great outcome in my life. So in year 10 I was going to Sydney Boys High School over at Surrey Hills and in year 10 I got a terrible school certificate which was kind of painful in the moment, but I thought it was going to be my get out of jail free card because you know when you get a bad exam result and you want to leave school, why did I want to leave school? Not because I hated it, because I wasn't doing well and I actually wanted to become a labourer. So that would allow me to you know, build up, start early, finish early, train afterwards, um, you know, play on weekends without, without any other commitments. So I thought that was a really sensible thing. So I then combined with the fact that I got a poor school certificate, I then took it home to my mum and I said, look, mum, I didn't do well. I'm embarrassed about it, but I really want to leave school. And she looked at it and she said, that was not a good mark. I think you're better, better than that. And she said, I know you want to leave school, but I would encourage you to continue on to year 12, which I saw no reason of doing. Why would I do that? Other than playing football for school, which was fun, you know, I didn't see any reason for that. She said, well, you know, if you get into play first grade and then if you get to play for Australia, which would all be good, and she said, I believe you can do that. She said, at the end of the day, you're retired by 27, 28, 29, you don't make a lot of money, you could get injured at 21, and then what are you going to do? So she said, you should have a plan B.